Okay, so um, some couple of students came and um, just asked me to clarify about race condition. Um, anybody else wants me to repeat that or? Yeah? All right, well. Um, let's talk about this race condition here. By the way, if you thought this is playing with your head, there's a whole hour of this coming up. <laughs> okay, so race condition. So we have this um, SR um, ledge. This is, remember, this is the NOR implementation we talked about ages ago, about 40 minutes ago. And we said that with um, um, we, we showed how if we have separate inputs, um, as in if either S is 1 and R is 0, if R is 1 and S is 0, then we end up in either the set or the reset state, and then we can maintain this state um, if we now push them both to be zeros. So we do just remember um, Q or not Q, we'll just remember that particular state. And then if we push um, or if we pull both of them high, then we do end up with a zero, zero, and that's what we said was an undefined um, state. And the reason why we said um, it's undefined is because we wanted both Q and not Q to be complements of each other. So, but, but this is still a steady state, as in there's no, nothing changes because this zero here is propagating down here, this zero is here, one node with zero is a zero, um, and then at the bottom part, one node with zero is a, is a zero as well. So everyone agrees this is a steady state, nothing changes. We're happy how we got there. Yes, good. Now what I'm going to do, I'm changing S and R both at the same time to be zero and zero. Um, let me just see. No, I'll keep that side. Now I have a situation and the inputs to both NOR gates are 0 and 0 all at the same time. What you have to realize is those two things work in parallel. They're not um, depending that one should finish before the other connect. It's two electrical circuits. They're, they're just there. They work in parallel. So 0 NOR 0 will give me an output of 1 where here at the same time 0 NOR 0 will give me an output of 1 as well. Now, because it happens at the same time, both of those ones will propagate through the wires to the inputs of the NOR gates, and this is just the wires. And now in both NOR gates, we have the situation where um, we have 0, no 1. 0, no 1 will produce a 0 at the output on both Q and not Q which will propagate back in. And now we have again the situation where we have 0 nor 0 um, in both NOR gates, which produces a 1 at the output, which will propagate in and produce a 0, which will propagate in and produce a 1, which will propagate in this is zero, and so on and so on. Um, so if we were just looking at Q and not Q, forget what's actually happening inside. If we're observing Q and not Q, we will see um, the signal, if you connect it to an oscillator, for example, um, going zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Now, what I said by the, uh, about connecting it to an oscillator, in the lab, in lab four, you will actually have to construct this um, using your um, NAND chip. And one of the things that we will ask you to do is try to cause a race condition in this structure. Now we said in real world it's really hard to change S and R together at the same time, but we can um, set all three of them to one and then flick just the input C um, into zero which essentially have the same effect of changing 
um, those not S and not R together at the same time. <coughs> now, some what we've actually observed um, in previous year in the structure is that our, our NAND chips are so good and they're so matched together that we will actually see the oscillating behavior on the output LED. You will see um, your LED, well, what you will see is actually your LED um, becomes a bit dimmer. So because it flickers um, 0, 1, 0, 1 so quickly, what it will look to you is if it's a tiny bit dimmer. And then um, this sort of implies that you are experiencing this race condition. Now, what I said, okay, so connected to um, an oscilloscope and actually have a look at it, the problem is that once you connect, you, you touch the wire with the oscilloscope, you're changing the conditions on this um, circuit. You are actually adding um, some more capaci capaci capacitance in one of the outputs. Now, one of the signals will actually propagate slower. Once you touch the wire, it will actually fall into one of the um, conditions. So you can't actually see it in your oscilloscope. You, you're just going to have to prove it to yourself by looking at the LED that it becomes um, dimmer. And this is something you will see in the lab, um, which will be really interesting. And this to show that it's all very real. I'm not making this up. Um, are there any other questions about race conditions? Yeah. Sorry, do you get? Uh, not really. I mean, it will, if you really want to go down to it, the, the constant switching um, will um, essentially draw more power from your sources. Uh, when you draw more power from the sources, some of this will be, um, actually half of it, will be um, observed as heat and it will heat up the chip. I don't think, though, that with our chips, um, because we, we really, each one of those NAND gates really have four transistors in them, I don't think you'll actually be able to feel it heat up. Uh, but because it will, it will, you know, the atmosphere will cool it. Uh, but yes, you do get more power drawn and therefore more heat. Um, every, by the way, there's a common knowledge, um, and we will talk about it in week 12 when we talk about transistors. Every time you switch values in one of your gates, um, some current is drawn from the sources and therefore consumes power. Um, and this is CMOS technology. When we are in a steady state, we actually don't consume any power at all. It's a white light because we do have some leakage currents and, and there is a little bit of power, but we can um, look at it as if no power is drawn. Which is why, by the way, CMOS is such a great technology because it's very power efficient. Um, and therefore, when you have faster computers that you switch, you know, you, you bring up your clock speed um, up, so the switching is quicker, you have more switching, therefore it draws more power. That's, you know, power theory on one leg. Anyway, um, does that answer your question? All right. Um, so we, I wanted to show you the d -Latch. And then um, tell you about um, those D-Latches. So the D-Latch, um, which is a bit more useful in the real world than an SR-Latch, um, now has its control input. And when we build um, real circuits, we usually um, connect this C, the control, into a clock signal. Something that uh, goes, it's like a, a train of, um, well, it's a, it's a square wave. Now, every time um, this clock is high, then the latch is transparent. Whatever is in D will propagate out um, <coughs> to Q. Once um, the, the clock is low, then the latch just, uh, the latch just um, keeps its state, and Q not Q will stay constant, regardless of what you put on D, until the next time the clock goes high again. The problem with um, this kind of design, when we talk about real um, state machines or real sequential systems, if you remember the very first slide of this lecture, and I don't want to start flickering back, there was some feedback even from your, um, 
from your storage element back through the combinational circuit back into the um, um, storage elements. So besides the little feedback that's going on inside there, in real sequential um, circuits, we do have a constant feedback uh, between the uh, different storage elements as well. Now this will cause a problem, and let me show you an example when um, this starts becoming a problem. And I'll take the very simplest circuit I can come up that will um, screw up this design. So we know with the, we have the d -letch, and we will connect the output of the d into the input through an inverter and then have um, a clocking signal. Now we said when the clock is high, the, um, the latch is transparent, so whatever you see in D will propagate through to Q. And when the clock is low, then it just maintains its um, value. In this case here, if we, end, if we say started with a zero value in D, which will propagate through to the output, but then it will be fed back through an inverter, which will now make that a one. One will go through, the latch is transparent, Every, anything that changes in D goes through and changes at the output. So this one will propagate through, make this a one, then this will be a one, and then a zero will propagate through. And again, this sort of oscillating behavior that we saw before, now it's because of something else, but we get this oscillating behavior. And this is while the clock is high, when the latch is transparent. So we have this oscillating uh, behavior. Again, this output will keep changing 0, 1, 0, 1 until the clock goes low. When the clock goes low, whatever the last thing that was observed on D will be maintained in this latch. So as the clock is low, Y will set into a constant value, either a 0 or 1, but we don't know what it will be because just before that, it kept oscillating between 0, 1, 0, 1 very, very quickly. Clearly not a very good design because we don't know what we're going to end up with. We want to come up with some sort of design that will make sure that Y only changes once per clock period. So one clock period might be um, you know, one high and one low of the clock. That's a clock period. And if we can manage to come up with a structure that does this, we will have a whole lot more flexibility in designing our sequential circuits and we will be able to predict quite accurately what the output will be um, or what we want it to be. So this is a possible implementation for something that will actually uh, do just that. I'm taking two SR latches and I'm calling it master and slave. The names will become um, obvious in a second. And I'm connecting them such that I have the master latch at the beginning. It's just a regular SR latch that we've seen before. It's two outputs, Q and not Q, will now be connected to the inputs of another latch. Another SR latch, same thing. Um, but now, um, I just renamed, well, I call those intermediate signals Y and not Y to distinguish them from the outputs Q and not Q. But the control signals for this slave will be the inversion of the control signal that goes into the master. So what's going to happen now is that depending on what my clock signal, my control signal is, only one of them will be enabled at any one time. If my clock is high, then the master will be transparent, where um, the slave will be blocking or maintaining its value. If the clock goes low, this will now be disabled and will retain whatever value it had um, just before the clock went low. But now this will be transparent and anything that's seen on um, y and not y will propagate through <coughs> to the outputs q and not q. Now how does that help us at all? Let's start analyzing this um, a little bit. And this is how it's going to work. Let's, and let's have a look when the clock is high. The clock is high, then the master um, latch is enabled 
and I can put whatever values I want on S and R. So if I, for example, put S equals 1, R equals 0, then this will make this master ledge being in its set state, and then Y and not Y will um, observe the set state, which pretty much follows the S and R um, values. But the slave is not enabled, so um, those signals will be sort of waiting at the entrance to the slave, but they will not actually propagate through because the slave is disabled. What we have stored in the slave is whatever it had um, previously, which we don't know just yet. So um, during the master, any change in S and R, sorry, during, during the, when the clock is high, looking at the master, any time the clock is high, they, um, the inputs will affect the intermediate signal, but we won't actually observe it at the output. Now, actually, let me leave that one there. Now we will um, observe what's happening when the clock is low. Now the master is um, blocked. Whatever um, is stored in the master is the last thing we observed on S and R before we actually blocked it. And this is what will be um, in Y and not Y. For example, the example I gave you before, if the last thing was a set state, then we will have a 1 and 0 there. Now the slave um, is enabled. So whatever is in the inputs here will propagate out to um, the outputs Q, which is the output to the external world. Those Y and not Y signals are not actually observable by the user. They're just the internal signals of the structure. Now, naturally, because the slave um, latch is now transparent, any change in its inputs will cause the outputs to change. The thing is, its inputs are now constant because the master is disabled, holding the Y and not Y um, values constant, and therefore Y and not Y will not change, and therefore Q and Q and not Q will not change. Because nothing, nothing can change um, those inputs there. So essentially, what we've um, we got going, combining those two things, um, if you sort of take a step back and look at the big picture of what it does, is that while the clock is high, we can put in whatever wa values we want. But the output Q will not change because the slave is disabled. And I'm looking at this situation over there. Once there's a falling edge of the clock, so when the clock changes from 1 to low, um, whatever we had last on the inputs there, essentially will now be seen at the output Q. Because it, all this time before the um, clock went down, it was actually waiting, um, possibly changing in the Y not Y. Once I disable the master, these ones will propagate through. So it's really only what happens um, less on the master um, ledge that will propagate through to the Q. I can play around with my S and R as much as I want while the clock is high. Once the clock falls, this, the less value will propagate through to the Q and will stay there until the next falling edge of the clock. Why until the next falling edge? Because now it's got some value while, um, while the clock is low. When the clock goes high again, the slave is disabled. Obviously, Q and not Q will not change anymore. And then only when again we have a falling edge, that's the next time uh, Q will change. So now if you, if you Again, take a step back and think about the big picture. Our Q outputs can only change at the falling edge of the clock and only then. No other time. We can go wild with the inputs and it will affect what eventually will happen at the outputs and we will see this because we're going to analyze another waveform. But really, Q and not you can only change at the falling edge of the clock and only once which is the behavior we wanted. We said 
We don't want something that changes um, constantly at um, several different times in the same period. Um, it will only change once every period of the clock. Now, um, before I analyze the waveform, are there any questions about this? Because it is slightly confusing, <coughs> but if you sit there and actually think about what's going to happen, in fact, this is what I'll do now because I will analyze um, the waveform and we'll see how those intermediate um, signal change and then what happens um, next. Um, so now I have a waveform and this will play with your head. I'll take this very, very slow again. If something is not clear, raise your hand right away. We have some waveform which has the inputs um, to this, um, to the whole structure, but the inputs are the S, the R, and the C, the set reset and the control signal. The control signal is just a clocking signal, so um, a square wave. The outputs of this whole structure or Q and not Q, where we're assuming um, not Q will hopefully always be um, the complement of Q. Now, in this waveform, I actually only drew, um, well, I ha only have a place for Q, and I also want to analyze the intermediate signal Y. Now, unless I tell you otherwise, then not Y will be the complement of Y. In places when this is not true, I will point out and say, watch this, this is where um, it breaks apart. Now the way I want to analyze this waveform is to actually start analyzing one side. So uh, look at the master, start drawing um, the output of Y. Then after a while I'll get so far and then I'll say, all right, let's see during this time what happens in Q. And then we'll take, uh, based on whatever the values for Y and not Y are, we will start looking at what the outputs Q and not Q are. And hopefully we will get this behavior where um, the latch only changes, or the flip-flop, sorry, this is the flip-flop by the way. Um, I forgot to mention this thing. This is important. Um, the difference is, by the way, latch can change its value um, more than once per clock cycle, or in example, when the clock cycle is high. It's transparent, it can change any time. Flip-flops usually change the value only once per clock cycle. There. So now um, we want um, the operation of this flip-flop to change only the falling edge of the clock and we'll hopefully this is what we'll get from this waveform. So initially as we start off any waves we don't know what's happening in the circuit before everything in its sort of unknown condition. We're there, we don't know what's going on. And I'm only um, analyzing the signal Y for a starter. Then the clock goes high. When the clock goes high, the master um, latch is enabled. Anything that will happen on the S and R inputs will affect Y and not Y. And this is just regular latch now, yeah? So let's see what happens on R and, um, S and R. Well, S and R are both low. When they're both low, we know that the latch just um, keeps its current value. Um, what was the current value of this latch? I don't know. Nobody told me. So I still don't know actually what the value is because um, the first thing that um, happens when the clock goes low <coughs> is it says, well, keep what you had before. I don't know what I had before. So we'll continue with my little unknown until something happens and then the clock goes low. When the clock goes low the whole thing is disabled and whatever I had before will just be maintained. Well, I don't even know what I had before so I still don't know what I have now. So I'm still in this sort of unknown situation. Now in this case here you can see that the S signal actually changes before um, the clock goes high. But because this latch is disabled, we are actually ignoring um, 
whatever's going on there. So even, um, even so, so pulling this S high will not affect the outputs Y and not Y. It will affect it now because now the clock will go high and now the sledge is transparent. Whatever uh, we will see at the inputs, well now we have S high and R low that will put us in a set state and then we can start, uh, we know that we will be in our set state for the entire duration where the clock is high. Now once the clock goes low, we maintain the last thing that we had in the latch. The last thing was a set um, state and we can just continue um, this line throughout the whole period. And this is something, by the way, I will do from now on. Once I get to, um, to a clock that um, drops low, I will just continue whatever um, signal I had for the duration when the clock is low and I wouldn't actually mind what the inputs are because I know that um, they're blocked out. Then the clock goes high again, the master is enabled and we're observing both S and R are in their um, low state. When both of them are zeros, we know it just means keep whatever you had. Well now I know what I had because I was in the set state. So we'll just keep this set state for while the clock is high and definitely while the clock is low. Because when the clock is low, I'm keeping what, whatever I had. Then my, um, my latch is transparent again. I'm looking at the inputs. Now R is high um, and S is low, which means let's go to a reset state. Take this down. And this will pretty much stay constant. Well, in this square here, because the inputs don't change. And then in this square here, because the clock is low and the latch is blocked. Next, the clock is high again my S and R inputs are zero. We just maintain whatever we had in the ledge beforehand, which was zero here, and we continue it while the clock is low. So far, so good. Any questions? Now let's analyze the slave up to what we've got to now. Let's see what happens with the slave. Now the slave is uh, fed by Y and not Y. So far we haven't done anything funny with um, our S and R signals and when I say uh, funny things I mean like putting them high at the same time together because everybody knows that's funny. And um, so we can assume that not Y will always be the complement of Y. During, you know, when, when we're doing illegal things and no problems there. So at the um, output Q, initially, when Y and not Y are unknown, um, the slave, remember, will only be enabled or transparent when the clock is low. When the clock is high, we will maintain what we had um, in the slave previously. So we start off in this unknown condition. Now, as we, I'll do it on the screen, as we go through, well, in this case here, um, the slave is disabled, so we still don't know what we had. We'll continue with the unknowns. In this case here, it is enabled, it's transparent, but the inputs are unknown, so we don't know what we will get um, at the Q either. I mean, if Y and not Y were 1 and 0, we will get 1 and 0. If we're the other way, we'll get the other way. It's unknown at this stage. Then um, the slave is disabled when the clock is one. So we will just continue this unknown thing. And then finally something happens. The clock goes low. The Y signal is set. So we, we're in our set state. And then the Q will just follow um, the inputs Y and not Y. So we will go into our set state while the clock um, is low and maintain that state, whatever it was, in this case it was set, while the clock is high and this is disabled. The clock then goes low again, so um, Y propagates out to Q. Well, Y during this whole time is high, so we will keep it high. But when the clock is now going high, then we're just maintaining the same state 
in this um, slave ledge. So even though Y then changed, Q still maintains um, its set state because the slave is actually disabled while Y is low. Then the clock goes low again, which enables the slave. And now we're looking at the Y input, which is um, in the reset state. And now we'll start following whatever um, Y is and maintain that value while the clock is high. Then the clock goes low again. We're looking at Y, which is still low. So we will follow Y and maintain it while the clock is high. Now let's go back to our Y signal and continue to see what's happening here. Remember, the Y signal changes when the clock is high, block when the clock is low. So the clock is high here. Both S and R are low. We will maintain a signal, which was low, and then keep maintaining it while the latch is disabled. Then the master is enabled, transparent. We have a set signal at its input, so we'll go to set. Now, look carefully. What happens here? We have a set signal, and the reset is low. Then there's a tiny instant here where both of them are low at the same time, which means just keep whatever you had, which was a set um, state. And then the reset signal goes high, and the set is low, which is not a problem. But our Y will now go low because um, there's an order here to go to the reset state. And all this is happening while the clock is still high. So the master is actually enabled. And we will keep our um, reset state, obviously, while the reset is high. And then when it goes low, both S and R are low, which means keep the current state. And then naturally, when um, it's disabled, we will keep that state as well. Then it's enabled again. We're looking at the S inputs. It's now um, high. R is low, so we go into our set state. Um, the set state is still applied uh, while S is high, but then once S goes back to low, and because R is low as well, we're pretty much saying just maintain the signal that we had, and we will keep that to here, and then it's disabled, so we will drag it even further. Let's see what happens in the Q signal while this whole thing is happening. In the Q signal here, we said the, the slave is enabled when the clock is low. So here it's um, enabled um, and we'll follow the Y signal, which is low. And then it will just maintain its value while it's disabled. Again, when it's low, it will look at the Y signal, which will be low as well, and then maintain its value when it's high. And then um, it's enabled again. We're looking at the Y signal, which is now high. So we will go high for this duration and for the cycle when um, it's actually disabled. Now, what's the difference between what happened up to here, which is where I stopped, and then what happened next? In a way, if you remember the desired operation of this um, SR flip-flop that we wanted is that whatever's um, at the inputs at the time where the fall uh, at the falling edge of the clock, this is what um, this is the input we want to uh, propagate through to our ledge. Which, if you look at what's going on, um, let me use a different color. Yeah, okay. If you look at the falling edges, so this is still unknown, but um, if you look at the falling edges here, the falling edge here, we had S um, takes us to the reset state. No, sorry, S will take us to the set state. R is zero, so we want the, the set state, which is what the latch will be um, set to once it's uh, for the next whole cycle. Then we look at the next um, 
falling edge, we look at the um, S and the R, and they say, all right, maintain the value because S and R are both zero, and this is exactly what we've done. We've maintained that um, higher value that we had. The next falling edge, now we want to reset, and this is what happened. We went down and maintained this for the next um, cycle, and this is all nice and good. Um, looking at the next falling edge, it says um, keep what you had. Yep, good, we kept what we had. Next falling edge, similar, keep what you had. Great, we kept what we had. Now here's when it starts being a little bit funny. In this case here, if we look at um, the inputs S and R, it says keep what you have. All right, great. I kept what I had. I'm still low, I had low, I'll keep it low. Although the S and the R had this little thing going on while um, the slave one was disabled. So during this whole time when the slave is disabled, there was some little spikes on S and R, but you know, they didn't seem to worry us too much. But if we look at the next one, the falling edge, S and R are both low, which means keep what you have, but my signal went high, which is not quite what I want. I wanted to keep that um, low value that I already had in my flip-flop. Now, why did, uh, why did the value actually change there? Because we had this set signal here that snuck in while the master was enabled, changed the value of our master and the output of the masters, and then went down um, to be zero and zero. So what, we, what happened? We set this master into a set state, <coughs> which then, when the clock dropped, then propagated through to the slave, which set it in its set state. But the slave, but, the, but if you look at the whole um, flip-flop actually, then as far as we're concerned, the falling edge um, the inputs just said, just maintain what you have, which wasn't the case. This kind of behavior is what we call, what we call um, once catching, where um, master slave flip flop, SR master slave flip flop, will catch any glitches or any set signals that appear for a very um, short time. By the way, it doesn't necessarily have to be a set signal. In fact, we did see it here as well, where it actually caught the set and the reset signal, which is why we were so lucky that the thing actually um, sort of maintained its value. If this reset wasn't here, we would have caught um, the set signal down in the slave as well, and then we would get um, the signal going high, even though this is not the input at the falling edge of the clock. So this is not great because, again, it, um, it will influence um, the whole behavior. If you have storage elements that are connected um, in a loop um, to themselves or in some feedback loop, then you might start catching um, those little glitches or s those values before things settle down into steady state and you will get sort of, well it's not quite unknown, but you will get non-desirable behavior. So this is a problem with one catching. Now let's continue analyzing what's going on because it is um, getting slightly more interesting. So if you look at the Y signal, um, the master is enabled. We are good up to here, and then both S and R um, go high. When both S and R um, go high, both Y and not Y will be high at the same time. So in this little spot here, we do have an undefined um, state where both Y and not Y are one at the same time. We don't, we don't 
see any effect in Q just yet because um, this is disabled, so this doesn't affect anything here. Now, um, we have the situation when we have uh, the control signal for the master being disabled. So S and R are both high. The control goes from 1 to 0. And this is exactly what we had for the race condition. And this Y output will start racing. Now, during this time, it is racing while um, the control signal is, um, is low. There's this whole thing, feedback race that can going on. But once we are re-enabling um, the clock, then um, S and R are still one and one. But now we have a very, you know, it's the undefined state, but we can determine what's going to be the outputs in Y and not Y. These are, in fact, going to be one and one again. So we will have one and one. So Y is one, but and I will give you a little bit of a circle to denote that not y is one as well. It will not be um, it, it will not be the complement of y. Then both those signals go um, down to low at the same time, which is now we have the situation where the control is high, but then both s and r go from one to zero at the same time, causing another race condition naturally. And we will start racing while the, um, the latch is disabled. And then we have this um, zero and zero um, input, which say, which say just maintain whatever you had. Well, what we had is a race condition and we will keep racing until the end here. What happens with Q during this whole thing? Well, Q is now um, enabled when um, the clock is low. What Q will see in Y and not Y is this race condition. Now, one of few things will actually be observed in Y, in S and R. Other Y and not Y will in fact um, change at the same time. So um, it will go from 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So any time we'll go from 1 to both, um, both 1s to both 0, this will cause a race condition here. Um, and then if you really want to look into the details, one both, once both of them are 1s, this will cause both of those to be 1s for only a split of a second until these two become 0, which will cause a race condition. So now we have a race condition inside a race condition because this goes between a race conditions and both 1s. Let's summarize it with we don't know what's going on. Then um, we're disabling this thing. This whole thing was just in a race condition. Um, or we don't know what the inputs are. Now it's disabled. We will either settle down to some unknown um, condition or it will keep racing. So still a bit unknown. Then when it's enabled again, Y is still going wild over there. So we'll keep um, racing. And you can apply all the reasoning, both that um, when it's enabled that both these are in race condition or when it's disabled that we don't know what the value is going to be. Either way, um, you stay here. Please don't pack up just yet because if we finish today I don't bring you in on Friday. So we only have two more slides. And these are important slides. Shh. All right. The quicker we finish, the sooner you can get out of here. If you're not quiet, we won't do anything fun on Friday. All right. This is a standard symbol for an SR flip-flop. Um, 
It looks like an, um, the symbol for an SR latch, only shh, come on. Only we have those um, symbols there to denote that um, the, the flip-flop will change. Um, sorry, will catch all the inputs while the clock is high, and then will settle down when the clock goes low. So it's a little bit of a this symbol. Let's not dwell too much about this. Now, this is what it all converges to. The edge triggered D flip flop. And this is what you will use extensively in this course and for the rest of your life when you do digital design. So in order to fix this whole race condition um, issues, we can um, replace this um, master SR latch with a D latch. And if you remember the difference between the SR latch and the D latch really is just that we're tying both the S and R to the D signal where the R is tied through an inverter. So now what um, we're going to happen is that whenever um, we have a falling edge of the clock, there will always be some determined value here. Because D cannot say either maintain your value or um, it could not put us in the undefined state. Um, having only one input will make sure we always are in either the set state or in the reset state. So um, from the D point of view, we do have to have a new value um, to absorb in every time there's a falling edge of the clock. But now we won't suffer um, from any race conditions and we won't um, have the flexibility of just saying just maintain the value that you want. Now um, in this structure here the value um, of Q will be updated on the falling edges of the clock. Um, similarly we can have a positive edge triggered D flip flop which is will take its values in D every time the clock goes high. And the difference between them really is just to add this inverter um, at the beginning of the clock and then um, whenever we have a positive edge of the clock the D input will be read in and um, the Q will follow that on positive edges. To almost finish it off um, these are the symbols uh, for the D flip flop for the positive edge triggered and the negative edge triggered. Um, the only difference is the bubble at the C. You will see this symbol a whole lot. This is what we will use for storage elements um, for the rest of this course. We will talk about different types of flip flops um, in the coming few weeks. Uh, but this is what will be most extensively used. No. Uh, by the way, I have a couple of announcements after this slide. This is the slide. Please don't pick up just yet. <laughs> I've got two minutes until four. I'll try to rush it. Um, just another addition to our um, D flip flops that um, usually come up. This is why I want to bring it up here. Is asynchronous set and reset signals into the flip flop. We said um, the D flip flop only um, get updated at the positive edge of the clock, sometimes you want to add to force a value into this memory element by using asynchronous um, signals. In this case here in this example we have active low set and reset signals and we can actually force um, say a value of one if we assert the set signal, we can force a value of one into this memory element regardless of the clocking signal and regardless of the um, input in D. These things come, very, come in very useful uh, when you start up a circuit and you don't know what values are going to be in your memory elements and as we said and you will see it in following weeks those memory elements are the ones that actually control the state of your circuit so we will use those reset and set signals to actually force our circuit into a certain state so we will force all of our flip-flops, say, to a zero value or all of our flip-flops into a one value and then we will start um, playing with them. Any questions so far? 
Okay. Shh. One last thing. Um, I'm finished with the slides here now. And I said that if we, come on, don't be on the edge of your seat. We said if we finish here, we'll do something fun on Friday. So um, I'm under the impression that you know we're all engineers. We don't do enough fun things. And <laughs> <laughs> except drinking, drinking don't count. And it's one thing to you know sit down and you know solve equations and, and write your books, but we need a little bit more outdoors activities, more movement. So um, on Friday, instead of the lecture, we will have a Zumba class. <laughs> and, um, and this is how it's going to work. We're, we, are, we are actually having a Zumba class. It happens to be the 1st of April. April is full. It's not a joke. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a real thing. So Friday 11, uh, we'll start the, the class. Actually, we'll start 11, at 10 past 11. So all, all of you can get there on time from your uh, previous <laughs> class. It will be shh, it will be at the uni gym um, in the multi-purpose room one, which is upstairs. If you're familiar with the uni gym, um, just go in and then you go around and then to the stairs. If you're not sure where it is, just ask at the reception. It's a private class for us, so um, it's going to be me and you and, and some instructor. Now, I don't know how many of you have done Zumba before. Um, I haven't, but, but it's very, um, it is a little bit intense. You will sweat. So I will, um, I do recommend to wear um, either comfortable clothes or even shorts um, because, you know, it, it is quite physical activity. Make sure you bring a bottle of water because you will need a lot of water. You don't have to come. <laughs> I want to assess you on this one. It will be fun. I want to assess you in how good or better a dancer you are. I suck, I'll tell you that. But one rule, if you do come, you dance. So none of this, I'm just here to look now. If you come, you participate. Sorry? No. I have, I have actually, um, no, I won't be. But I do have an excellent instructor for this. It will be a lot of fun. Um, very, very high pace, good music. Um, just come along and enjoy it. We will, by the way, I know some of you have classes before and after. Um, we will finish around quarter to 12. Um, so you can all go um, if you need to change or uh, make, make it in time for your next class. Um, and I will hopefully see you there. I do recommend everyone to attend.